In our last video, we explored the work of the first pioneering antiquarians of the modern age. We discussed how archaeologists Arthur Poznanski and Neil Steed, along with many other astute individual researchers, unraveled a possible key to unlocking the true purpose and indeed historical significance of the site. They concluded that the site, due to academia's reluctance to tag any ancient ruin with a date of more than 4,000 years, is the oldest ruin on Earth. The archaeologists discovered an alignment with the solstices and spring equinox, which only occurred around 17,000 years ago. However, there are many other intriguing areas of interest yet to be fully understood. Along with the volumes of photographic documentations of precise measurements, independent researchers also discovered that the site's gray stonework also possesses a curious magnetic property. The question is, if these ancient people knew of this interesting characteristic, what was the purpose of using said stone? Was the stone slowly magnetized by a technology once present at the site, now lost to history? Along with the gray stone, however, the site also contains an equal amount of red sandstone, which was used to build the site, yet this red stone does not share the enigmatic magnetism of its gray counterpart. Perhaps the sandstone is somehow immune to what was responsible. Perhaps this is why the Great Pyramids were built from sandstone, to avoid the masonry taking on this magnetic charge. Perhaps, but I digress. Puma Punku is what we like to call a smoking gun, a site which clearly displays masonry skills of its ancient constructor, precision-cut stone masonry which today could only be achieved with the use of advanced stone-cutting machinery. Shrouded in mystery, the archaeological side of Puma Punku is one of the biggest headaches for mainstream archaeology to explain. So how would an ancient culture, one which was far less capable than modern man, cut, shape, and transport from many miles away, carvings out of some of the world's toughest stone accomplished with such incredible precision? A group able to transport blocks of stone, sometimes weighing far more than 50 tons to the site, effortlessly placing them in position, often using a placement technique indicative of polygonal methodology. Interestingly, after investigating possible causes for this characteristic, it was realized that the building material was not granite, as it had long been assumed, but was in fact andesite. Andesite is the most iron-rich volcanic material we are aware of. It can contain around 15% iron oxide and can have up to 4% magnetite. Thus, the stone, it seems, could have already been displaying magnetic characteristics when placed where it now lay. Yet the question still persists. Why did this stone get selected as the building material for the temple? It was built by a civilization that brought the stone from many miles away. So, the suggestion that it was the only stone available would not be a logical conclusion. It was chosen by a group who were seemingly meticulous in their application. So, it is quite possible that the magnetic characteristic was somehow utilized by the builders. Thankfully, it is only a matter of time before Puma Punku's secrets are fully understood, and we finally discover who built it. It is a place we find highly compelling. There are countless unexplained ancient enigmas which can be found atop a remote mountainside of Peru, within a site only rediscovered within known modern history, now famously known as Machu Picchu. Polygonal masonry. Although it is a technique found all over the world, the standard of polygonal masonry on show within the ancient sites of Peru is undoubtedly some of the most impressive found anywhere on Earth. However, as we have discussed in the past, with varying degrees of reaction to our discourse, ancient civilizations the world over, nearly all currently unexplained ancient ruins, no matter where they are found, has some form of celestial significance built into its construction. The controversial question, however, is why? Why do we see the monitoring and indeed celebration of solstices throughout ancient culture. Why, and indeed how, were these precise alignments accomplished? Is Intuahatana 
yet another astonishing relic, left as a nod to the advanced knowledge of its builder, people who somehow constructed the clock, and indeed Machu Picchu, the surrounding settlement. Now tied to countless legends as to its origins. The most popular, however, is that Intehuatana is, quote, the place where the sun becomes tangled, end quote. It was constructed with precise alignment, perfectly angled to face the four cardinal points. It is located at the top of the mountain, atop a structure adorned with 70 steps leading to its position. It is unquestionably an ancient upart, and is considered, by all who are aware of its existence, as a wonder of ancient technology. A solar clock, somehow created to indicate when it was precisely the winter solstice. It is, coincidentally, a time which is hugely significant to modern-day Peruvians. Known to the Incas as Inti Remi, the long-held local celebrations seem to coincide with the purpose of the clock, once undoubtedly created using tremendous effort and knowledge, all in the effort to signify this same date, one which is officially the most important celebration of the entire empire. Is this pure coincidence? Or is this celebration a surviving tradition dating back to a forgotten antiquity? Incredibly, there are, in fact, two Intihuantanas or solar clocks within ancient Peru. One is located in Pisac, and the as forementioned Machu Picchu solar clock, positioned on what is now classified as a sacred mountain. On September of 2000, a beer company was making a commercial when one of their cranes hit the solar clock. They unfortunately broke off part of the point and left the relic in a terrible condition. The National Institute of Culture, however, the INC, sued the company for damages in 2005 and was awarded an undisclosed amount. Who built these incredible ancient solar clocks? Why were so many ancient civilizations obsessed with the sun and indeed its activity and precessions? Were these ancient civilizations trying to tell us something? Why were so many ancient quarries left in a state of seeming abandon? As if the ancient people, once undertaking the movement and placement of ancient megaliths so huge, we today still cannot explain how they were moving them, seemingly vanished right in the middle of said undertakings. Are these solar clocks, like the ancient quarries which still mystify all who explore them, a surviving clue as to the fate of this past civilization? They are undoubtedly highly compelling. The cylinder dredges up mud from the seabed in the form of long cores. The types of tiny fossils found at different levels in the core shows the sea temperatures of the past. Geologists have collected enough sea cores to form a detailed history of climate during the last million years. Dr. James Hayes leads the research. The climatic record in these deep sea cores tells us that there have been eight ice ages in the last 700,000 years. It also tells us when they have occurred. There are many enigmatic, astonishingly well-executed ancient ruins found all over the world with some regions in particular displaying overwhelming masses of evidence supporting the posit of a past highly advanced builder, these areas often littered with displays of incredible ancient feats. Yet our next place of interest possesses some of the most incredible rock-cut chambers to be found anywhere. And just like that of the Giza Plateau or the Inca Trails of Peru, Turkey, along with its ancient counterpart Lebanon, still contains a smorgasbord of ancient uparts, mystifying masonry skills, and gigantic stone trilithons, all found within what would appear to have been a major settlement of this now lost civilization. The reason why we attest to many of Earth's ruins, having once been the work of a past now lost civilization, is the number of unexplainable features nearly always discovered at these puzzling ruins. Therefore, to understand that all the knowledge utilized to build such sites, the methods for lifting such stones conveniently forgotten, is to suspect that they were instead the work of an equally forgotten civilization, 
it appears to be a logical hypothesis to pursue, one which we indeed have been, which we have found bared much fruit. We believe we have now amassed enough evidence to support our claim beyond any reasonable doubt, subsequently discovering a far more fitting tale of events in regards to the true origins of many of the world's largest of ancient ruins. Hattusa is a melting pot of baffling construction techniques and surviving ancient artifacts. Within permitted timelines, the site predictably has a well-explored period of inhabitation. Yet any explanation as to how these more recent ancestors achieved its construction conveniently eludes modern academia. Hattusa was also known to have been the capital of the Hittite Empire in the Late Bronze Age, added to the UNESCO World Heritage List in 1986. The main focus of this video, however, is in relation to a rather curious anomaly at the site, a unique object which could be described as an out-of-place rock cut. Known as the Green Rock of Hattusa, this mysterious stone's origin, or perhaps more importantly, its past function, is unknown. The green stone was once so perfectly polished, it originally had a mirror finish. Yet why this particular stone is here, why they chose this green stone specifically, or who brought it to the site, is a complete mystery. There are many other impressive features found at the site, including holes bored through massive megaliths with seemingly laser-like precision. It also has the ruins of what has been confirmed to have once been a sphinx. All of these characteristics indicate that at one time, in the very distant past, Hattusa was a place of significant importance, sharing an uncanny amount of similarities in build technique and layout to many sites of South America. Yet its green stone is unique to this site only. The question is why? Why was this green stone quarried, cut, placed where it lay, then polished to perfection? Was the stone merely a gift from an Egyptian pharaoh, as modern academia would have you believe? Or did the green stone of Hadusa once serve a more profound purpose? One day, we will find out. It is an object which we find highly compelling. Chufut Kale is an astonishing ancient city, argued by mainstream historians as dating back only to medieval times. However, this we suspect is possibly due to it being documented during this time as having served as a fortress within the Crimean Mountains, a national monument of Crimean Karatis culture. Although argued to be fairly recent archaeology, we believe, however, that upon closer inspection, a far more intriguing, far older story for its origins begins to appear. Identifiable advanced features so often discussed here on our channel, found throughout the ancient world, remnants indicative of a far older, far greater, technologically advanced group having once been responsible. A group who had access to knowledge and stone-cutting technology that has not only left the same signature scars all over the planet, an investigative undertaking we have previously explored regarding similarities and differentiations to identify signature methods, an ongoing investigation in an attempt to identify separate, lost, highly advanced civilizations, and most importantly, how many there were. The site was clearly built by a group who were also capable of quarrying and placing enormous stones, sometimes over 1,000 tons in weight, atop one another. Many people are aware of the remarkable underground city known as Derinkuyu, a settlement we have covered in the past. A gigantic ruin carved straight down 80 meters into the bedrock, rumored to have been lit using a pipe system which teased natural gases out of the strata, lighting a candle-sized flame at regular intervals throughout its entire structure. We know of this amazing ruin due to its incredible rediscovery. When a local purchased a property in the area, he set about doing some renovations. However, upon knocking down a wall in the house, he was confronted with the entrance to an amazing site. This in turn attracted the media, thus Derinkuyu's public popularity, regardless of its controversial nature, was cast in stone with rather difficult to explain origins. However, 
Chufut Kale, although itself a partially underground, partially above ground, yet no less incredible ancient city, also carved with incredible precision from the bedrock of Earth. The site was discovered and studied in depth initially by mainstream funded individuals. As such, predictably, it has subsequently been little shared publicly. This, regardless of its incredible nature, its prehistoric appearance, and the fact that it even appears to be older than its more famous counterpart, Derinkuyu. The site is largely ignored, and this is undoubtedly due to the institutionalized powers that be, who constantly monitor and thus control the financial incentives. Anyone requesting exploratory funding, whether within such fields as education, archaeology, or history, will simply be refused any application for a funded expedition. This reluctance to approve any in-depth public exploration of the site has long kept the lid on these ruins, and we feel for good reason. For although Chufut Kale was once masterfully carved from solid stone, created to house many hundreds of families and individuals, the erosion present on the site is also staggering. Many of the once refined chambers are slowly losing their form and returning to nature, with some caverns seemingly identical in appearance to many sites academia would simply dismiss as natural formations. Yet regardless of this dismissal and the deliberate overlooking of its grandeur by certain fields of study, we find Chufut Kale highly compelling. We have in the past covered countless ancient anomalies found amongst the many ruins of ancient Peru. Hillside fortresses, mountaintop sanctuaries, completely self-sustaining, technologically advanced group whose ruins still contain countless as yet unexplained methods of construction and often incorporating inexplicably large megalithic blocks once quarried, carved, transported, and then somehow, seemingly effortlessly placed atop one another. Masters of architecture, irrigation, stonework, and horticulture, this group, although claimed to have been that of our far less capable recent ancestors, the Incas, built self-sustaining, earthquake-proof settlements high among the clouds. Sites often built at altitudes far higher than 2,000 meters above sea level, with these ancient, once indigenous builders also, one installing simple, yet incredibly effective gaps in the pathways to such sites as Machu Picchu, allowing the inhabitants to draw the bridges to the site, cutting it off from any possible invaders. Once these bridges were removed, sites such as Machu Picchu became virtually impenetrable. We have previously covered many incredible Peruvian ruins. The Intihuatan, for example, is yet another relic we recently covered here on the channel. It is yet another example of this now lost civilization's past knowledge and extraordinary now lost capabilities. A solar clock, precisely bored into being, directly out of the bedrock of Earth, which precisely indicates the solstices. We discussed how certain characteristics of many ancient sites, most notably the apparent Mayans masonry, Incan, and Neolithic sites, such as the Stonehenge within the UK, all display a past obsession with solar precisions. Furthermore, the constructors of these sites all displayed an uncanny urge in particular and undoubtedly most prominently at the site of Machu Picchu to undergo a mammoth undertaking to create what now appears to have merely been a quirk of engineering entwined within the architectural planning of Machu Picchu itself. It is often perceived as overkill so much polygonal masonry is present virtually everywhere it could be laid. Perhaps these efforts of stoning up literally every crevasse at the site, regardless of whether it would be on public display or not, may have merely been due to a purely aesthetic obsession by a once highly capable, now lost civilization. One who must have perceived such, as yet unexplained tasks, as child's play. The incorporation of natural geological features into the sites is yet another curious characteristic of Machu Picchu, which many individuals who visit the location are perplexed by. It would appear that the ancient civilization responsible for this incredible site's existence, like a number of the other sites we have covered previously, incorporated the living rock of the mountains into the construction plans of their past sanctuaries 
Rather than have simply carved them flat, many ruins display a collaboration of such natural stones into the buildings themselves. The Temple of the Condor is one of these incredible examples. A natural rock formation, which was formed millions of years ago, was spared destruction and was incorporated into the building of the site, subsequently becoming a place of worship. Many believe the temple was a pilgrimage of religious worship. The masons who manipulated the Temple of the Condor into the site skillfully shaped the rocks below the main menhir into the shape of outspread wings of a bird largely believed to be that of a depiction of a condor in flight. According to a number of studies of the ruin, upon the floor of the temple is the carving of the condor's head and neck feathers, flowing up into the body, which is the natural formation we still see today. This completes the posited figure of the three-dimensional bird. The temple of the condor is undoubtedly one of the most spectacular examples of what these so-called pre-Incas were once capable of. Like so many other ancient sites found all over the world, share so many characteristics with ancient Peru, the question is why did the builders of all these sites go to such great efforts not to displace or even incorporate seemingly common rocks into the build of the sanctuaries? Who were the builders of Machu Picchu? Were they a world-faring civilization? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. There are many ruins of ancient antiquity still in existence which tell a vastly different tale for the history of human civilization than that of its contradictory counterpart, namely modern paradigm. One enforced, funded, and massively supported. A tale of events merely written by a victor. However, thanks to our ancient ancestors' incredible abilities, Many of their ruins and relics so well constructed, often made from complex, elaborate, or gigantic materials, can tell us all what a well-funded modern academia simply cannot explain, thus is staunchly rejected and ignored in favor of the illusion of an authority over our species akin to that of an oracle. One of the most popular and predictably easily argued of ancient sites for our case of events our conviction in the belief that there is a hidden history of man and indeed Earth, one of a far greater antiquity for our species, with many now lost civilizations having once come and gone. The site is additionally one of the largest ancient anomalies of our planet. It is, of course, the Great Pyramids of Giza. Due to the structure's immense sizes, the evidence for several conservation efforts in the form of casing stones littering their four-sided facades. The sheer size of the stones involved in the build, the amount of stone used, the precision of the once hermetically sealed, constellationally aligned ventilation shafts, and the many different stages of erosion present on these varying sections of the construction efforts, indeed, makes the Great Pyramids a great avenue of study, and one of strong conjecture in the face of an adverse and conspiring academia. Our hypothesis, we feel, due to our compiling of the many inexplicable factors of antiquity, has now all but been virtually proven beyond doubt. For our opinion regarding the true history of Earth is not just based upon the objection of the illogical explanation, widely given for the origin of the pyramids of Egypt. It is also based upon many other areas of ancient history, which not only support our claim, but if one sticks to mainstream historical ideology, we'll simply find the task of explaining these ancient uparts simply impossible. They simply cannot exist. And our next artifact of interest is no different. Like King Tut's dagger, the Beth Shearim glass slab. Found in Switzerland by amateur archaeologists, it is known as the Hand of Preels. Not only is it the earliest, most elaborate example of bronze and gold work ever found, but, quote, we do not know either the meaning and the function attributed to it. Its gold decor suggests that it was an emblem of power, a distinct sign of the social elite, even of a deity. The hand is extended by a hollow form that suggests it was originally mounted on another object, perhaps as part of a scepter, end quote. Who made the hand of Preels? Is it really 3,000 years old? 
If so, how can it be the earliest example of this form of metalworking, yet be so elaborate in nature? The hand of Priels is unquestionably an ancient upart, and could quite possibly be a surviving relic of a once highly advanced yet now lost civilization. We feel this hypothesis is far more logical, and as such, makes the hand of Priels highly compelling.